when you write multiple choice questions, you're intentionally designing all these bad solutions and sometimes you just make them all bad. Right? So, that's my dog barking. I think someone's delivering a Amazon package or something like that. Um, okay, well, it doesn't look like there's not many questions then. So we'll get going on uh, what we're gonna do today. So we'll just do a little recall. And um, that was the theory of, so what we did in the last class is we showed that order um, can be placed in NP, right? So, oh, there's a question. I knew there was a question coming. For us, A3 question 1B, does N represent the number of bits? Yes, N is defined to be log to the base two of T, right? So for all that, that's the notation. So in this course, unless otherwise specified, little n is the number of bits in whatever object you're pro processing right if it's a graph little n is the number of bits that's used to represent the graph it's, if it's an integer capital n little n is the number of bits required to um, uh, to write that integer right to encode that integer okay and if you you can you can if it's an integer you can work out the exact number of bits but I find often it's easier just to deal with the approximation given to you by log, uh, log base two of t, right? And if you wanna make it a worst case, just make it a ceiling function, right? So obviously, you know, if you take log to the base two of 64, then you'll get an integer result. But if you do it for 65 or all the other numbers we usually get, which are not powers of two, you're gonna get a decimal number. You can just take the ceiling of that and round it up, right? It, it really doesn't matter because in big O notation, none of this Right, big O notation just says it's a function of log to the base two of n, right? Okay, good, good. Okay, um, so if you recall for order, right, we, we show that order, order is an NP problem, right? And the idea for this is we present, we present a certificate that actually gives the factorization of that um, exponent t, okay? So we have n, g, t. This was the idea behind it. Um, given any, any information, so modulus, base, and the exponent, we can show that this is in order with the certificate, right? With certificate, 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 c. And c is going to be the factorization of t. Okay, um, and the idea here is, again, remember what the definition of order is. The definition here is that uh, g to the t must be congruent to 1 mod n, okay, and that t is minimal. And that's the kicker, right, that t has to be the smallest value that, uh, for, for which that's true, right? And the idea behind this is obviously you have to check. So you have to commit to doing the exponentiation of G to the T and showing that that's mod N, but then you have to show that nowhere else for any smaller values of T uh, that that is in fact equal to mod N. So another way of saying that is G to the T is equal to one mod N only for T and for any value smaller than T, any ex exponent smaller than T, it is not equal to one. Right, and a brute force search will tell you that, but a brute force search is not polynomial time. So you have to figure out where to look and where the answer to that, and this is what we did last class, is we showed that the, the actual places to look are places where the exponent actually divides T. Okay, so here's the idea behind it, right? The idea, the idea behind this certification process for order is if we imagine we have g to the power 1, g to the power 2, g to the power 3, and then at some point here we get to g to the power 7, let's say, and g to the power 8, g to the power 9, and then eventually we obtain g to the t minus 1 and g to the t, right, to certify that this particular value in gt is in order, we have to obviously do this calculation. We commit to that calculation and show that g to the t mod n is in fact equal to one, right? And then we have to identify any of the possible areas um, with exponents smaller than t and show that those are not equal to one. 
And the ones that you have to look for are ones that actually divide T. So for example, let's say T was divisible by eight. We'd have to check, for example, that T to the eight, uh, sorry, G to the eight uh, would be not equal to one. Okay, so how do we know that this is not equal to one mod N, mod N, so mod N. Um, how do we know that that's true? Well, we need a factorization of T, right? So if P, P sub I, so again, the certificate C gives you a whole bunch of factors, P, uh, P1, P2, all the way up to P, K, I I think it was, right? So if, uh, let's say eight was one of these factors, we'd have to check for T, sorry, uh, we'd have to check for one of these factors and T divided by one of these factors would have to be equal to eight. Okay, so in other words, we have to check that G to the T divided by P sub I is not equal to one for all factors. Factors P sub I T. Okay, so you need a prime factorization of, of T to be able to do this. Okay, so in this example, if this one, let's say it was equal to one, that would imply that T is divisible by some prime factor and that's equal to eight, or in other words, T is a multiple of eight, okay? So if this was in fact equal to one, we'll put that in as an example of where um, your, your certificate would show that it's in fact not. So let's suppose that this was equal to, so for example, if G to the eight was equal to one mod N, uh, what we must have then in that case is that T is equal to some multiple of eight, right? So in that case, T would be equal to P sub I, some value, some prime number, times eight, or put it in the form that you have here, right? T divided by PI would be equal to eight in that case. Okay, that's where it has to happen. If you're going, if you're going to have it go to one, it has to happen. Um, with some period that eventually gets back to one here, okay? So that's our theory, our idea behind order. Um, here's how we take the next step, right? So the next step after this is, and people in the 70s had come up with this way of, this idea, this notion of certifying order, and they said, well, hold on, this challenges what we really know about prime, right, about primality tests, okay? So the, the notion before, the primes is that primes was an exp time problem. Right? So most people before that point believe that prime numbers. So we can define prime as being it's simply the it's simply the complement of factor, right? So let me turn the screen down so you can see this. So prime consists of all integers n such that n is not equal to p times q. So we just flip this around from equality for factor to not equal to not equal to p times q for all, all p, q greater than one. Okay, so that's it. So prime, prime numbers have no factorizations at all, right? There's no factorization, that's the definition of being a prime number. And, and most people prior to this sort of development of certification for order thought that prime, the process of primality um, testing certainly and verification was EXP time. Was EXP time. In other words, another way of saying this is it was not in NP. So prime is not in. The reason for that is let's suppose you're given a prime number. Let's take 89 as our example today, right? Because 89 is something we can actually certify with a PAT certificate fairly easy. Um, so for example here, example, let's say n is equal to 89, right? So you and I know that this is a prime number because it's relatively small. You can look it up on the prime number table. Um, but take those tools away, that prior knowledge, that prime as you have factual knowledge that it's an 89 or you have enough prime number table. The only way for you to really certify this is to provide a certificate that consists of all the integers going from one to square root of n or worst case, 
one all the way up to n minus one, and you try to division by all those integers. Okay, so a certificate for this C would consist of a list, list of integers starting at two because we need to find a, they have to be greater than one. So we'll start at two, two, three, four, all the way up to the square root of either n minus one, or you can just make it as n minus one because in terms of big O notation, it doesn't matter whether you go to n minus one or square root of n, it's still exponential time. And then using this certificate, you basically then do the whole process of determining that 89 was prime in the first place. So if I give you the, the number 89 and I give you a certificate, sorry, I just have a update thing on the screen, there we go. Uh, if I give you the prime number 89 and a certificate for this, right, you're then tasked with dividing 89 by two, 89 by three, 89 by four, 89 by five, and checking for each of those divisions or module, you know, taking a modulus that 89 minus mod two, three, four is never equal to zero, right? Which is an ex exponential time ver verification process. Okay, so verification, verification, verification is exp time. Okay, so for that reason, it was. In, in you know prior to the mid 70s it was it was thought that prime was not an NP right which is interesting because factor is clearly an NP problem right? it's easy to certify that something's a fact that something's factorable by just giving one of its factors right prime which is the opposite of that language it looked like it was not an NP right so here comes along this certification of order and Pratt and what Pratt did is he said well hold on Aren't prime numbers the case where n, g, and t, where t is equal to n minus one, is accepted by order? Okay. So instead of doing this, what we then do is we say, hold on, what about cases where n, g, and n minus one? So in other words, we solve order, but t is equal to n minus one. Okay. If we can show that some integer, some base, raised to the power n minus one, where this is the minimal value, we can show that this is in order, then we must have that n is a prime number because prime numbers are the only numbers for which this is true. They're the only numbers where you can actually have an order of n minus one for the actual value of your number n. Okay, and that's the basis for the, uh, for the primality, primality certificate but you get into some difficult, some technical difficulties here because if you use the certificate for order, what you can see is we're referencing prime numbers. That's the trick, right? We can get away with this for order because we're assuming that prime numbers can be certified somehow in some other method, right? In other words, we don't worry about the fact that these are in fact prime numbers. If we're trying to verify that an actual number is prime, we can't give a certificate that references other prime numbers. Right? What we have to do is give a certificate that references other prime numbers and each of those prime numbers produces another certificate and each of the prime numbers in those certificates produce another certificate. And then at the end of the day, we have to show that that entire tree of certificates can be verified in polynomial time, okay? So not only do we provide a certificate for t is equal to n minus one, the factorization of n minus one, we provide certificates for all those other primes. Okay, so I'll just write down, this is the idea. This is the idea here. To show that prime is in fact in NP, what we're gonna do is provide a certificate C and it's gonna consist of some valid witness, right? So C will be some valid witness G and it will be the prime factorization, so P1, P2, all the way up, all the way up to PK, prime factorization of N minus one, but then for every prime number that appears in here, we need another certificate. And then for every prime number that appears in those certificates. So we also have another certificate here for this, a certificate for this, a certificate for this. So that's the idea, right? We're gonna take this, this certification process that we have for order, and we're gonna implant it in a certificate tree, 
to certify that a prime number is true. And it's more work than certifying the order, obviously. Um, one of the new things we're going to have to do is for every single node on the tree that doesn't, so we'll see this later, but for every node that's not internal, we actually have to find a valid witness, a valid base. Okay. And the reason for that is in the order problem, you're given the base. It's defined in the problem, right? If you're just given a prime number, you just get the number N. No one gives you the base. So part of your burden for cooking up a certificate for it is to find a valid base for it. Um, so that's the idea. And what we'll, what we'll do now is we'll take a little uh, look at uh, Pratt's original article, right, uh, that I posted on um, Slate, right? And you don't have to, you don't, if you don't want to read the article at all or internalize it, that's fine. I just want to show that this is what it looked like in the mid-70s, right? It's initial ID, uh, ideation, uh, you know, if that's even a word, right? But when it was initially thought up, and Pratt does make mention to um, the tree structure, Right. And then what's happened over the decades is people have formalized this using um, a nice tree structure, which is really, really easy. It's basically an algorithm that you can run. OK, so actually, let's do that right now. Let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at the original article here, because now that we've we've talked a little bit about the theory. So we'll look at the article and I posted that on Slate. I think I, I put it in there last week. So if you go under resources here, it's one of the papers that I've added here. Um, and let me just open up. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, it's written in um, old school. Uh, basically, it's a proof system, right? And we can we can avoid learning this whole proof system and the axiomatic rules that are being used here because we take our proof and we put it in a tree structure, right? Uh, we have data structures and algorithms to handle things like this now. Um, at the time, these were not, you know, it was, I guess you could say this is a little bit of showing off, right? Uh, to be honest, it's, it's going a little bit above and beyond what you really need to do to, uh, to show this. But again, that was, that was apparently Pratt's style. Um, every single line in one of his proofs is going to be represented by a node or um, a level of nodes on our tree. Okay, so you can almost see the tree divisions here. And what we'll do is we'll skip down to where he starts talking about uh, visualizing these proofs. This is the structure we're going to be using, right? So basically what it boils down to is this proof here that he used for this very large prime number, right? You can see all the steps that are involved using, um, uh, using the proof system he's established. But all of those steps reduce to this very compact graph. And what we're going to do is sort of pick a midpoint in between where we don't, we don't really settle on this highly compact graph because that can be tricky to build. But we're going to build, we're going to uh, deploy an algorithm that basically produces a tree that's halfway between the proof system and halfway between what he calls a picturesque proof, right? All the information is there. It's just easier to generate it step by step. You just follow an algorithmic routine to do it. Okay. So that's the idea. And then of course, the, the only other thing I wanted to show um, is that this had immediate impact on, on the problem of uh, the class NP, right? Um, this was sort of the turning point where people realized that you could have languages and it wasn't necessary, you know, it, it just because you can't come up with a way of verifying in polynomial time doesn't mean that that doesn't exist, right? It basically was a big um, uh, addition to the theory of computation here in terms of crypto languages uh, by saying that you, you're never sure of anything, right? Uh, just because you can't do it right now doesn't mean it can't be done. You just may have to look or unturn some things and take a look at alternate techniques, right? So that's the idea with that. Um, let's start with, uh, so let's go back and we'll do a, um, uh, we'll do a numerical example, and we'll do a Pratt primality certificate, a big tree for it for um, the number. Let's pick 89 here. 89 is a nice number because it only has a couple of levels to go through, and uh, that'll get you started on this uh, assignment. Okay, so here's your example, right? Example. Example, I can spell early in the morning. <laughs> cool. 
you're given n is equal to 89, right? You test this um, by doing trial division up to root uh, square root n, and you determine that it's prime. Now you're tasked with providing the cert certification process for 89 that someone can receive your certificate and they don't have to do all that trial division, right? So in other words, they can work out and certify in polynomial time that yes, n is in fact prime, n is equal to 89 is a prime number, right? And the first thing that you're gonna need is a witness. And the witness has to be such that, so your first step is to find a witness G, find witness G. Okay, so find the witness G such that, Obviously, the order finding problem, so n, g, so such that 89, g, and 89 minus 1, which is 88, is an element of order. Okay. So <clears throat> here's the thing, right? When we're doing the order, order solving, uh, certifying the order, um, triplet of information, g was given to you. Right? So G came as part of the information. Now you're not given G, so you have to find it, right? And this is, again, once you've found it, you can provide it to the verifier, and the verifier doesn't spend any time looking for it. And on our end, if we're building the certificate, we have to look for it, right? So we need an algorithm that determines a valid witness for this. Basically, we need an algorithm that tries bases and finds the one base, if it exists, and it primes the prime number, it has to exist finds that base such that g to the 88 is equal to 1 mod n, and that's the smallest value. Okay, so in other words, find, find g to the 88 is equal to 1, is congruent to 1 mod n, 89. Okay, and I can make this a little bit neater here. So, Right. where um, there are no other values, so where 88 is minimal. Right? So basically, there is no other value like g to the 11, right, or g to the 8, where it's equal to 1. Okay? And 88 is the minimal value. 88 is the minimum. Right? So let's do that. Um, it, it's very difficult to do this manually, right, and arguably even for small numbers uh, because there's so many exponentiations to do. So what you do is you write yourself a program. And again, if you're solving those assignment three uh, multiple choice questions, uh, th this is one of the, remember I gave you the warning and start saying some of the problems may contain things that are very annoying to do manually. Uh, use of Python is highly recommended. This is an example of one of those, right? So let's switch over to, um, uh, to a terminal window here and solve this one quickly in Python. So share. What we'll do is we'll close this one up. I will open up chat bubble in case there's any questions here. And we'll just start up a terminal. See how we go. Okay, so Jupyter book. Start this up. Perfect. And we'll do a new Python window. And I'll post this on. Um, don't worry if you can't keep up with the coding here. I'll post what we do. So we'll call this, um, what are we, March 16th? March 16th, save that. And then I'll post the um, HTML version of this, right? So um, we have n is equal to 89 in this case. And it's conventional to just start with g is equal to two, right? And then go g is equal to three, four, or five. Actually, if you, you, you can only, you can go by prime numbers if you want, uh, but let's try g is equal to two. So g is equal to two. We'll start by, and I'll put a comment in here. We'll say try g is equal to two as the initial witness. Okay, and see what happens. Um, now what we want to do is create a for loop that goes through and shows us all the, remember that array of G values? We want it to print out the exponent so we can tell what the, um, what the exponent value was. And we also want to print out G to whatever um, exponent it was, X or T, right, um, mod N. Okay, so we're going to say for T 
and range. And let's use X actually. Let's not confuse it with T. Uh, for X and range. Uh, for X and range N, right? So we'll go all the way up to, if N is equal to 89, we'll go all the way up to 88. Perfect. That'll stop exactly where we need to go. Uh, we want to display somehow the power of X. And you know, we don't need to do this for zero. So we can start at one, for example. So going from one to N, um, let's print out X. And of course the power of whatever base we're dealing with, which is G to the X and mod N. So this is, again, this, this will be G to the X mod, mod N. Okay, so that's the, uh, the Python function for doing all this stuff quickly, right? So away we go, let's see what we get. Okay, so again, here's our exponents, right? So this is our exponential, okay? uh, sorry, for G. And then these are our values, and you can see right away we have a problem, right? Here's the problem at x is equal to 11 or g to the 11, we found a one, which means that this is not a valid. So g is equal to two is not a valid witness that proves this is in order, right? Because for sure, when we go down to 88, because 89 is a prime number, we know that anything to the exponent 88 has to be equal to one. We're getting a one here, right? But we're also getting a one every 11 steps. And the reason for that is because n minus 1, 89 minus 1 is 88. That's divisible by 11, right? It's divisible by 11. So when we take 88 divided by 11, we're going to have um, g to the 11, et cetera, right? Uh, or when we do, uh, it's also divisible by 8, right? So when we take um, 88 divided by 8, we're going to be calculating ones here. So there's an example we were talking about, you know, what is a possible subperiod, right? That if you have um, uh, g to the t is equal to one, where do you have to look in between? For the number 89, it turns out we have to look at 11, right? And we found it here, okay? So we conclude that g is equal to two is not an appropriate choice, right? So that's our conclusion, right? We'll just say here we conclude, I'll just put this in the comments, right? Conclude, conclude, that g is equal to 2 is not a valid witness. Okay, so, and obviously you can aut automate the search. Um, I don't want to spend too much time doing the programming part here, so we'll just copy and paste this into a new cell. Um, and we'll do it again, and obviously we'll do it, I, I know what the base is going to be, g is equal to 3 will work, right? So we'll try again for g is equal to three and we'll find three is fine in terms of a witness, okay? So try g three and this is not an initial witness. Next, right? Um, and then we're not gonna conclude, this will actually work. So we don't need any comments here because we found it, okay? Mod n, all right, so we'll run this one. n is equal to nine with now a witness of three. Here we go. So we run, uh, we run it, and again, what we're looking for is in the exponentiation range of the exponent from one to 88, is it one anywhere else than 88? And as you scroll through this, you see that it is not. All 88 numbers are cycled through, and it only goes back to one, the step before going to 89, where it's gonna take the value of three again, right? So three is again, the appropriate witness to use, and this is proof, by the way, that 89 is prime, right? So this is proof that 89 is prime. Um, this, so again, when you have, if you can find a base and you can find a number um, such that the order of that base is n minus one, then that number must be a prime number, okay? So that's the idea, all right? So just before we turn the, uh, uh, turn back to the whiteboard. That's all we needed to do in Python, right? So questions about finding the witness or finding a witness. It's not like three is the unique witness. There's a whole bunch of them, right? We just need to find one, right? And once we find it, we embed it into the certificate. The verifier doesn't have to have to find anything. They just use what we give them, right? So about finding a witness, a witness, uh, wit, witness, or n.
hopefully you can hopefully you can um so Sarah says uh, would this process still be considered to be an exp time absolutely right but here's the thing we're doing it in exp time and we're generating a certificate that can be quickly evaluated in polynomial time right so don't don't think that this what we're doing here doesn't allow you to solve or determine whether a number is prime in um, in polynomial time, right? We're trying to cook up, cook up a method that you give someone what you say is a prime number, and then you give them a data structure that allows them to do the computations and certify a hundred percent proof that that number is prime, without having to do this search in Python, right? And without having to do trial division. Okay, so yeah, so this is an EX, what we're doing right now, witness finding is an EXP time process. It takes exponential time to uh, generate your witnesses. Um, is there a range for the witnesses? Yeah, sure, the witness, the range, yeah, the range for the witnesses can be anywhere between two and, and mine, it won't be, um, I'm trying to think of a case where it will be anywhere between two and n minus two let's say n minus one i'm not sure that that will ever give you i haven't done i can't really cram the math into my head that quick let's say between n and n minus two and i'll put dot 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 saying i i'm not sure whether you can get the n minus one in there maybe someone can come up with an example where no witness where you can actually put for sure you have a wide range of um, uh, values to look for your witnesses Usually two is a valid witness. In this case, I intentionally picked 89 because two is not a valid witness, right? But you'll see as we do our Pratt certificate, as we go down the tree structure, two is gonna be the witness for all the other nodes on this graph. And the, all the other nodes are just the prime numbers in the certificate for 89, right? Yeah. Good, those are good questions. Any other, uh, any other questions? Okay, so let's, uh, let's save this and go back to normal mode here and we can start building our um, certificate, okay? So our certificate, what it's gonna look like, it's gonna have, um, it's gonna be rooted at 89. And then what we're gonna do is we found, so we'll say in Python, we found G is equal to three, okay? Find the witness, uh, witness G. So in Python, as Ms. Sarah pointed out, that's, it is an exponential time process we use to find this, but that's okay because we're, we're certifying it with the result of that. In Python, uh, we found g is equal to three, and g is equal to three is going to be the thing that we append to the root node of this of this tree. Okay, so here's the the root of the tree, and it's rooted at 89. And at 89, we provide a witness of g is equal to three. Okay, and now what we do is we provide the factorization of 89 minus one. Okay, so that's one of the computations we have to do here. And let me just, maybe I'll move this a little bit over to the side so I have, because there is a few manual calculations we need. So let's actually keep this over here. I think we'll have enough space. So 89 and G is equal to three. It's going to be our root node. Okay, and then this space here that we'll put, let's put it right here. This is going to be called the root node V. So we have V is equal to 89. Therefore, B minus one is equal to 88. And what we need is the factorization of 88, right? And again, prime factorization is not a polynomial time process, but that's okay because we're doing it and we're presenting the results to the verifier, right? So 88, obviously this is eight times 11, right? So this is equal to eight times 11. But here's the thing, our certificate has to have all these numbers being primes. So even if you see a number like 9 or a number like 27 or a number like 8, you have to decompose it into the individual primes. Right? So it looks weird, but 88, so 8 times 11, this will be 2 times 2 times 2 times 11. Okay? So that's going to be that those numbers, 2 times 2 times 2 times 11, are gonna be our second level of this certification tree. Okay, and the way that you usually structure it is you put the any any prime numbers other than two are gonna be on the left child, and then all the other children go out to the right. 
Okay. Um, and we'll get to the two is a special case, right? But basically, uh, you can stop there. Okay. So we're going to have this going to heaven. And then we have these three twos here. So here would be one, two, three. This is your, so this is level zero. This is level one of the tree. Okay. So when you look at, uh, if you're looking, been looking at assignment number three and wondering, you know, what's the structure being used? The node gets a label of the prime number, right? And the children get labels that are associated with the prime factorization of the node above, right? So that's the idea. Okay. So um, what computations do we have to show now? So we have to um, show some computations. Actually, you know what? Let's build up the tree first and then do the verification process, right? Let's not do them at the same time. That can be confusing. Let's build a, the um, certification tree and then go on, okay? So the thing about um, the certification tree here is that when you get to a two, these are endpoints, right? And the reason is, is we, two is one of our axiomatic primes. In fact, it's the only one, okay? So two is a self-certifying prime, right? It's basically the first prime number so we do not need to provide certificates for anything that results in two as a prime factor. Anything greater than two, three, five, seven, eleven, etc., is going to need further certification. So the way that this goes is you continue this tree downward for any nodes that are not equal to two. So here's our next level. Our next level, I see two, two, two. This these stop. Okay, so these all stop stop because two is recognized as a self-certifying prime but 11 keeps going so my new um, node is going to be b is equal to 11 here okay so b is equal to 11 b minus 1 is equal to 10 and I, now i need to factorize 10. i need a prime factorization of that so 10 splits into a nice 2 times 5. so 2 times 5 so 11 is going to go into 2 times 5. So we put five over here, two over here. Okay, and two is a stop. Right? Two, you can stop computation there. The five we need to, we're gonna need to go on. Okay, so now we go to our next level here. Our next level, we have a node, a prime node here of five, and you have to do this for any prime node in the level. Um, so our prime node here, B is equal to five. B minus one is equal to five minus one, which is four. Four is two times two, all right? So five is gonna go down to a two times two. Okay, so five goes to a two, two. Okay, and that triggers a full stop, right? So that five goes to a two, uh, two and a two. These are full stops. Now this uh, structure is almost complete what we need to do is find, so remember two doesn't need any further certificate, but there are going to be certifying steps you need for 11 and five. So we need a valid witness for 11 and five, and then we're done with our tree, right? So let's do that. Um, a valid witness for five is two and same thing for 11. Okay. So maybe we'll put that in, in red here, but also in Python. What we do is we find a base value g is equal to two. Five, we have g is equal to two. So this is usually, this is additional information that you have to append to your tree structure, right? You have the label and then some additional information associated with that label, which is a valid witness for 11 and a valid witness for five, okay? So we'll add that also in, so these, these, these have to be found And it doesn't have to be Python, but you know what I mean. You have to do some exponential time computation to, to get these witnesses. Also, so the G is equal to two and two. And usually two works, right? Occasionally you come on a prime where two doesn't work, then you go to three. Sometimes you have to up your game to five or seven or maybe even 11. Right? But usually for two or three digit numbers, you can get away with just searching those, those two or three or four values. 
So now we have, so this is a complete tree. Okay, so this is a Pratt certificate. Certificate T. Okay, it's a Pratt certificate tree. It's not exactly what appears in Pratt's original um, article that I posted on Slate, but it is a much, <laughs> it's much easier to process and to organize the information in this way, right? Rather see the tree laid out here with all the certificates that you can see um, in a way that makes it easier to verify his method involving the, uh, the axiomatic lines and a theory uh, are not as easy to follow. Right? So this is a very, very easy to follow. It's a data structure that captures everything. That you need. So Pratt certificate T4 is equal to 89. It's a specific certificate, tree certificate for the prime integer 89, right? So uh, there's the certificate before we do the verification, right? Questions about generating that certificate. So questions about generating T, right? And when I say T in the assignment, I'm referring to the tree that is the Pratt certificate for a given Good. Yeah, everyone like, right. So, you know, the, the, the paper is really complex, but once you put it in this nice data structure, it's actually, you can sort of see that all those complexity layers are kind of elusive. There's nothing really that complicated going on here. Okay. Um, so let's do the verify on it now. And just to verify, I'm just going to take up as much space as I possibly can here. Here's your verification. So we have that, here's our verification. And the verification process consists of doing two things at each level, right? So we'll start here at the top. The first thing we need to do is verify that 89, sorry, we have to, we have to verify that three to the 88 is equal to one mod 89, and that three to the um, 88 divided by any of the prime factors is not equal to one mod n. Okay, so there's always two for any given level in the tree, there's two things you have to check. I'll put the headers in here and then we'll just do the, the calculations in here, right? So we have to check always that g to the v minus one is in fact equal to one mod n, okay? So we'll do those first on the left, and then on the right, we have to check that g to the v minus one divided by p of i is not equal to one mod. So these are the things that you have to check, right? You have to check that first of all, it's going to one. And then you also have to check that one does not appear in that array of exponents. And this tells you exactly where to look because you've been given all the prime uh, factorizations. Okay, let me just turn the screen a little bit here. Okay, so let's do that. So the first thing we have to check, and this is where you do either a bunch of manual calculations, or if it was a large enough number, we've actually already done these calculations for, um, for g is equal to three in Python, right? We did that brute force, so we can just use those results here. The first thing we need to show in this case for this node is that 3 to the 89 minus 1, which is equal to 3 to the 88, is equal to, uh, or basically this, 3 to the 88. Let's use some compact notation. 3 to the 88 mod 89. Nine. 89 is equal to 1. Okay, so we check, so again, you can use successive squaring, but in Python, we just saw that with the base three, the only spot where it goes to one was at um, three to the exponent 88, okay? So this one checks out. Now what we have to do is check two things. We have two prime factors, 11 and two. We have to check in addition to that, that G to the 89 
times one divided by 11, which is equal to G to the 88 divided by 11 would be 44. So this is 88. Sorry, that would be G to the 8. Uh, uh, G to the 88 divided by 11, which is G to the 44. I have to check that 3 to the 44 mod 89 is not equal to 1. And we also have to check it for the other prime factor, which is 2. So the 2s you also have to check. Okay, And you also have to check that, and actually, I'm just jumping to the 2 results here. My mind is always a couple steps ahead. So 88 divided by 11 is 8. Okay, so we have to look for that one, for the 8. And also that 3 to the 44. Again, 3 to the 44 is because if you take 88 divided by 2, let's put that in there, right? 3 to the 8. This 1 over 2 is equal to 3 to the 88. 2 is equal to 3 to the 44. Mod 89 is not equal to 1. Okay, so we have to show, show those two things. So you have to show quality here for 1, for the exponent of 88, and inequality for the exponents 8 and 44. Okay? And we have that. We could do that manually, but I don't want to run out of room on the board, and I also don't want to do the successive squaring steps because it's something that just adds a lot of time to this example. But we can easily show that by, and again, I'll do a share screen here. Remember that program we wrote in Python to find the base for the very first one? This will do it, right? So here's our base three, here's our various exponents. Which one did we need? We needed to show that three to the eight, three to the eight is in this case, three to the eight mod n is 64. Okay, which is not equal to 1, right? The other one we needed to look at is 44, and 44 is right here. And we have 3 to the 44 is 88, which is not equal to 1, right? So we've shown those two things on the right. And then obviously we have to show that 3 to the 88 is equal to 1, and it is. Okay, so if you've done your witness search for your root node, you already have these calculations done. So you can, of course, reference them, right? So, um, so we'll go back, right? So we've shown those. We're not showing them using successive squaring, but anyways, we have, we have the, the those results here. Okay. So let's go back to our original one, and give those a check mark. Okay. So in terms of certification, we've checked this, we've checked this, and this. And now we're on to the next node. Okay, so the next node, we'll start here. And the next node, we do the same thing, except now v is equal to 11, right? So the next node here will be everything with v is equal to 11. Okay, um, the base now is two. So we have to show, again, there's two things. We have to show that two to the 11 minus one. Okay, so two, to the 11 minus 1, which is equal to 2 to the 10 mod 11 is equal to 1. That's one thing we have to show. Okay, and of course, the other thing we need to show is that um, 2 squared is not equal to 1 mod 11. And I realize the board is kind of skewed here. Okay. Go back. okay. So we have to show that uh, 2 to the 11 plus 1 by 2, which is equal to 2 to the oh, 2 to the 10. 2 to the 10, 2, which is 2 to the 5. We have to show that that's not equal to 1. And of course, we also need to show that 2 to the 11 minus 1 over 5, right? Remember, for every, so what are this, what's the certificate for 11? It's 5 and 2. Okay, so we have to do this for 5 as well. So this will be equal to 2 to the 10 over 5, 
which is equal to 2 squared, and that's not equal to 1. So this we, we didn't actually do the calculations for because everything is mod 11. Right? So this is mod 11. Don't forget, every time you send node to the next node, your modulus goes with it, and it becomes the modulus of whatever node you're on. Right? So in this case, we're in mod 11, which is fine because it's a prime number. Right? So this is mod 11, and this is mod 11, and we have to show that that's not equal to 1. So let's start with this one. Um, this one we can do with our calculator, right? Um, so 2 to the 10, 2 to the 10. Again, I'm not using successive squaring. I'm just trying to show um, the net results here. So 2 to the 10 is 1024, right? And divide by 11 and subtract the integer part from that times 11. And there's your 1, right? So that 1, in fact, is equal to 1. Whereas this one, we have to do these calculations and show they're not equal to 1. Um, these ones are a little bit easier to do, right? 2 to the 5 is the same thing as, so 2 to the 5 is going to be a 32. And 32, we can just take a bunch of 11s off of that until we get to 10, right? So that's 10. So this one is not equal to 1. Oh, I did that in the wrong color. Give it that check mark in red. Okay, so that gets a check mark in red. And then obviously here, 2 squared is going to be 4, and 4 mod 11 is 4. It's not 1. Right, so this one is a check mark too. Right. So that's the verification for that particular level. Okay, so we've done the root node, we've done the first level. There's one more level to go, which is to certify that 5 is prime. I know it seems ridiculous, right? But it's only consistent if you do it all the way down to the axiom of 2 being the only one self-certifying prime. So we have to do it again here. Let's do it for 5. So 2 to the 5 is 1, which is equal to 2 to the 4 mod 5 must be equal to 1. That's the one thing we have to show here. And again, 2 to the 4, so we can we can actually do this one using successive squaring if you want. You can go 2 squared would be equal to uh, uh, 4. And then 4 squared would be 16. So we have 2 squared is equal to 4. 4 squared will be equal to 16. And 4 squared would be 2 to the 4. And 16 mod 5. Take away 5 3 times from 16, and you get 1. Okay. So there would be the actual, if you're doing successive squaring, like the instruction in, in the assignment say, you'd show some steps like this, manually doing the, the squaring process and then obtaining that result. So there's our result for the base 2. Now we have to show for the 1 prime factor, right? So 5, five minus 1 is 4, and 4 is 2 times 2. So we have to take... 2 to the 5 minus 1 divided by 2. That's the same thing as 2 to the 4 divided by 2, which is 2 squared. We have to show that 2 squared 5 is not equal to 1. And that can be done because 2 squared obviously equal to 4, which is not equal to 5, uh, which is not equal to 1. Okay, so there's the final two checks. Check there, change the color, and our final check there. Okay. Um, so there it is, the primality certificate, right, generating it. And then these would be, so there's a question um, in the assignment, which uh, you, may dis you may choose to do, you may choose not to do it, uh, which is the induction proof on how many, so basically this step right here involves exponentiation. This step and this step involves exponentiation. So there's one, two, three steps that I had to do here that involve exponentiation, right? Um, for this particular level, I had again, one, two, three steps that I needed with exponentiation. For this one, I only had to do one, two steps involving exponentiation. Okay, so the inductive proof on this, it says for any number, 
doesn't matter how big, right, the number of steps that you need to roll out that involve exponentiation, which of course are done in polynomial time using successive squaring, is a polynomial number of steps, right? And that's where you see the three log base two of that. Okay, so those of you who are interested in, in solving that one, you're gonna need math induction. So I realize I've lost half of you already, right? Everyone hates math induction or there was some traumatic event in the past. You just don't like it. That's fine, I'm not judging. I made it a choice this time. Um, but if you choose to do that, you basically have to play with what you see here, right? The calculations you're doing here and the tree structure. If you do an induction on that tree structure with these calculations, you can prove it. Okay. And that's the sort of endpoint, which is that we can verify any one of these trees in polynomial time, right? If the number of these boxes that we have to do is polynomial or approximately, uh, you know, there's the case where the, whether this is actually two or three in the box, but basically if the number of these, these ex exponential things that we have to check is polynomial and each of those things, exponentiation is polynomial and the whole verification process is polynomial time. So, any questions about that? Questions? Questions about verification now. Verification of T of a Pratt certificate T. Good. Okay, everyone looks pretty uh, happy with that. That's good. Um, so what we'll do, we'll definitely take a break now, right? Uh, we'll take a break for, let's say 10 minutes. Uh, during the break, I'll post, I'll post these whiteboards, right? So you have a, uh, you know, those to refer to. And I'll post the, the little bit of code that we did in Python if you want to use that as starting point for your own, uh, you know, uh, starting concept for, for writing a program that looks for witnesses. Um, the other thing, so the other thing I'll mention is witnesses have another name uh, and we've used them in Crypto One. Um, they're called primitive roots, right? So we've actually explored the concept of a witness for a um, uh, given modulus before. Uh, but we called it the actual, we called it primitive roots. And there's whole tables of primitive roots online, right? Uh, which you can use to verify. So if you're manually searching for them and you question whether there's an error in your code, you can you can check online and there's tables. Right? So for certain integers up to a given range, they list all the witnesses that are possible. Okay, good. So let's take a break. Uh, we'll take a break until, let's say 10.10. 10. Okay. So 1010. And at 1010, we'll come back, we'll do our next thing, right? For some reason, the other section ended up being a whole step ahead of, the, of, of, of uh, this group. I don't know how that happened. Maybe I was too slow last week or something. But uh, anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll get you caught up with um, uh, the lecture notes for week eight when we come back after our break. Okay. All right. See you in a little bit.
It just occurred to me um, before I erase this board, anyone have questions, uh, any lingering questions about our, uh, about our certificate example here specifically before it goes bye-bye? I mean, I took a picture of it and it's on the, I have a picture of it at least, uh, but if you had specific questions about the steps, it might be useful for me to ask questions before I erase it. So speak now or watch it go. I suppose everything goes eventually, right? What's the big deal? Yeah, one prime certificate. Can't hurt anyone seeing this go. Okay, uh, so our next uh, thing to cover today to get uh, back up to speed with uh, where we should be in the course um, is to talk about NP complete uh, languages. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the definition of what it means for a language to be NP complete um, and give some examples of specific languages. And the, uh, you know, the goal is to at least by the end of what we do in the next sort of 20 minutes, half hour is to be comfortable with solving some NP complete problems, right? Uh, the more types of problems that are NP complete, you've already worked on two of them, ham path and subset sum are NP completes. Um, and the more that you work on them, you get an appreciation. They have this feeling of there's just no way to get around the inevitable search of all the solution space that you have to do, right? That's really what it is. From a programming point of view, you do a brute force program and you think, oh, maybe I have a way of and inevitably or so far, as far as we can tell, there no one has found a way to break them, right? Um, so here's the context of, of all this. We have, again, we'll draw our box of problems, right? Box of problems, all can be brute force, so they're all EXP time. The ones that we can solve extremely quickly are our polynomial, right? Or relatively quickly are our polynomial problems. So here's our P, P group. And the P group contains, you know, your favorite things like um, the extended Euclidean algorithm used throughout computer math two and crypto one and crypto two, right? Uh, so that's a polynomial time algorithm. Um, other things we can put in there are things like uh, integer arithmetic, right? Uh, we can put in the pathfinding problem. Pathfinding problem would be in there. And then one latest addition that we just added to this was mod XP, right? So mod exp the caveat is mod exp is only solvable in polynomial time if you use successive squaring right so you can't just calculate the array of exponents and then get your result that way right you have to use successive squaring so that you take big steps and don't calculate all the possible things in between to get there okay. so there's that and then in np all those problems are obviously verifiable polynomial time but there are some problems that are not solvable in polynomial time, but are certainly verifiable. And those are your crypto languages, right? So the discrete logarithm problem, DLP would be there. You have uh, factoring. Okay, so if you're doing a key exchange or you're doing RSA, you're using these NP problems because um, it's difficult for someone, if, if you give them a modulus, which is the product of two primes, it's difficult for them to solve what those prime values are, right? So it, it's exponential time in solving, but it's polynomial time in verifying. If you want to prove to someone that n is in fact the module, the product of two primes, you give them one of those primes and the proof is done. Same thing for DLP, right? It's searching for the exponent in a discrete logarithm problem is an EXP time problem. The verifying can be done just by using the mod XP solution, right? If you know the actual value, just use successive squaring and verify, right? Um, so, and two others that we're adding now to this group are the idea of order finding, order. And because we can provide a certificate, that's what we are working on assignment number three, right? 
For the order finding problem, we provide a certificate, which is the prime factorization of the exponent t. And for uh, prime primality testing, right? so primed is in fact um, certifiable or verifiable in polynomial time using the Pratt uh, certificate tree, right? Which is what we did a couple of minutes ago, right? We can we did a, an algorithm for constructing the certification for any prime, and that's verifiable in a polynomial number of exponentiations. So here we are. These are the 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 crypto NP. These are the you know sum of the polynomials, and what we're going to be looking at today are the so-called NP completes. Okay, so they're right in here. Here are your NP completes. NP complete. We're looking at the elite problems, right? And I say elite because they their their computational complexity, right, is such that every other problem in NP and P can be reduced to it. Okay, so if you have something capable of solving an NP complete problem, solving something else in NP that's not in complete NP complete is not going to be any more difficult to it. Um, and some examples here that we'll look at today, the one sum that you've seen, AMPATH is one. So AMPATH is an NP complete. Uh, we have that, what was another thing? The subset sum. Subset sum is another NP complete. And two more that we'll add to the mix today are um, vertex cover, right? So it's a nice graph theory uh, problem. So we have vertex cover. Cover is another one. And the other one we'll look at today is SAT. And SAT, it's, uh, you're going to look at it and you go, well, what does this have to do with crypto? It has nothing to do with crypto. The reason why we put SAT in, in our notes and, and we give it honorable mention today um, is because it's the first NP complete problem and everything else was constructed based on, on the basis of SAT being uh, the first member in this in this class, right? And we'll get to you know, you know uh, showing that, right? So why don't we do, why don't we start with this? Let's do an example of what the vertex cover problem and what SAT is, and then we'll get into the definition of how you can actually show that something's um, uh, NP complete. So let me just see your current con. I still don't get what you mean by NP complete. Could you repeat that? So NP complete, you, we could do the definition of NP complete if you want. Let's do that. So current asks, why are, so basically current, you know, what you're asking is why are these problems any different from anything else in NP, right? This is why, mathematically. Okay, so if B is an NP complete language, right? So B is NP complete. complete. If the following two things hold, the first thing is that B must be a problem that's contained within this class of NP. So it must be polynomial time verifiable. Okay, so B must be in NP. Okay, so you can't have, say, for example, an EXP time problem that's not polynomial time verifiable being NP complete, right? These problems are too hard, all right? So it has to be within the scope of polynomial time verifiable. And the second, and this is the big one, is that A must be reducible to B for all languages or all A that's in NP. Okay. So, and if you want, you can look in the lecture notes. I have an, another definition where I sort of fill it out with more words. But basically, the two things you need to be NP complete is the language itself must be in NP, okay? So language must be in this big class. And the other thing is for every language that exists in NP, it must be reducible to your NP complete language, right? A is, so for all A, for all, A is all other problems, all other problems in NP. So B is a language or a problem. A is another language or problem. And what you have to show for it to be an incomplete problem is that all other languages in this bubble of NP are reducible to B. And so I'll give you the, so reducible is a, is a mathematical mind, right? I'll give you the hand-waving definition of reducibility, right? Um, which, give, which makes it make sense. 
And then what we'll inevitably have to do is the mathematical definition, which uh, usually doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> but hopefully it does. Um, so what this means, when you say that A is reducible to B, okay, so we'll add a little hand-waving definition here. Maybe we'll put it in red, okay? So when we say A is reducible to B, means, creating sense, that the computational difficulty or the computation, computational complexity involved in solving problem A is contained within the computational difficulty or computational complexity of solving problem B, right? So what that means is if you can solve B, you can then reduce any of these other problems to an instance of problem B and solve B in order to solve A. So that's the idea. So what this means from our point of view is uh, it means that the, is that the computational difficulty Computational difficulty of solving of A is contained within B. It's contained within B. Okay. And when I say that uh, within B, I mean it's contained within the computational difficulty of B. And if you want to get more mathematical about it, it really means the time complexity of A is contained within the time complexity of B. That's what we're really getting at. Okay? So if you can solve B, A must be easier to solve than that. Right? Um, a more formal definition uh, is it involves uh, creating a function, which is basically a reduction from the problem. Right? So formally, so this is informal, formally, um, formally, what A reduces to B means, A reduces to B means that there exists some function F, right? So formally, A reduces to B means there exists, exists some function F, some function F, um, such that F, so again, we'll write it down mathematically here, such that F of W, so all, let's, let's, let's see what this is, for all, for all W in A. So in other words, for all instances of a problem that you have to solve in A, you have that F of W uh, if W is in A, then F of W is in B, right? So if W is in A, if and only if F W is in B. Okay, so that would be your formal definition um, function. And the function F is what's called the reduction. Some function, this, this is the reduction. Okay, some function f has to exist, and it has to be a reduction of the instance of the problem in A to an instance of the problem in B. Now, this if and only if statement, it works one way. This, this is the one way that it points, right? Which basically says, if you, you can solve, if the problem is solvable in A, then the function on that problem must be solvable in B, right? It also works the other way. It says, if your function applies to some string W and it's solvable in B, then it must also be solvable in A, right? Um, so you can either do an abstract mapping of this or you can actually do a specific mapping of this, right? Uh, with the other section, I did the abstract mapping and sort of when, you know, there are a few questions about that and basically I went to a specific mapping and I think that helps. So we'll just jump right to the specific one, right? Um, and we'll say, Let's say that we're going to, let's pick what's some, some easy ones here, or let's pick factor as being our A language and subset sum as being our MP complete language. Okay. So for example, right? So for example, example, if A is equal to factor and B is equal to subset sum. Okay. 
What we're basically going to do is present some things here on the left that are an element of factor and some things that are not. And then we're going to present some things that are um, solvable in subset sum and some things that are not. And what our function has to do, it has to basically connect the dots from things that are solvable in factor must point to something that's solvable in subset sum. And if it's not solvable in factor, it has to point to something that's not solvable in subset sum, right? And the trick is to come up with that function, right? When you're doing a problem reduction, okay? So things that are solvable in factor would be for, you know, any composite numbers would be in here, okay? So the composite number, say four, that would be part of factor or the composite number 15. Any, any composite numbers would be an element of factor, 15, and we'll put one more in here for kicks, 9. Okay. So those would be in factor. Things that are not in factor would, say, be the prime numbers, 2 and 7. Okay. So when we say W in A, the things that are in A are 4, 15, and 9. So these are all W in A. And these things that I've listed here are W not in A. Strings are inputs that are not in A. Over here on the right hand side, we're going to need some things or strings that are have solutions in subset sum. Okay, so something that has a solution, for example, in subset sum would be, let's create, uh, remember what subset sum is, is you have a set of objects and a target and some subset of those objects equals the target, right? So let's pick one, two, and three, and give it a target of maybe one plus three is four. Okay, so that is definitely solvable in subset sum. Let's give one more here. So let's pick, say, um, two and five, two and five, and give it a target of seven. Two and five, and give it a target of seven. Okay. So if I take 2 plus 5, I get 7. That's an element of subset sum. And if I take the sum of 1 and 3, and 1 and 3, I get 4, so that's in subset sum. An example of something not in subset sum would be, uh, again, let's take this 2, 5. 2, 5 is our set, and we say make a target of 10. Well, it can't be done, right, because the maximum target you can achieve here is a, is a sum of 7. So that is not. So again, these are examples of... Uh, w, or f of w, right? So they're going to be results of the function e, b. This would be an example of something the function points to that's not an example, that's not an e. Okay? So our function now is takes the burden of connecting these dots, and because we're just doing an arbitrary example, we can just connect them point by point. Right? So we can say, if the composite number is 4, I'm going to point it to this instant of the problem in subset sum. Okay? So our function is going to point from here to here. So in other words, f of 4 is equal to this particular subset sum problem. Right? It's equal to 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay? And there's no connection between the 4 and the 4 here, right? The key is that this thing is in A, it's in A, if and only if this thing is in B. This thing is in B, right, and the thing that it originated from in A was also in A. Okay, that's all we're doing, right? 15, we can point it to this one if we want, okay? So we can have f of 15, um, and we can have that being equal to this guy, which is 2, 5, 7. And for that matter, it's not like we have to point them to unique versions of the problem. I can also point this one to the same one. Okay, so I can have f of 15 and f of 9 pointing to this particular problem that's solvable in subset sum. Now what we have to have is we've done for all the things that are in the language, but it's if and only if. So for things that are not in A, they have to point to things that are not in B. So I'm going to point to this thing that's not in B and point 7 to this thing that's not in B. So f of 2 would be equal to dot, 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 that problem you see there. So 7 would also be equal to dot, 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 the problem that you see there. So there you go. A bit of a long-winded answer to your question, Karen, but 
this is the definition for these for these problems to be an MP complete. They have to meet this definition, right? And this definition involves the concept of reducibility. Hand wave in a hand waving sense, complexity of this guy language A must be reducible to B means computational difficulty in solving A is contained within B. More specifically, the formal definition says for everything that can be solved in language A, you need to get a function that points to something that can be solved in language B. That's the idea. How is nine point? Yeah, so you're, you're stating, so you're basically saying that's great. Why am I pointing nine to two five? There's no methodology I'm using here at all. I'm simply defining it as a piecewise function. And, it, and the, the piece that points nine to this problem is basically if composite number is equal to nine, then the function will point to the subset sum problem two, five, and seven. It was completely arbitrary how I drew that. Okay. The trick is when you get, and the reason why we have to be arbitrary here is because these two problems are not close, right? So the factoring problem has nothing to do with the subset problem. There's not, there's no factoring involves finding, uh, you know, a factor for a, for a large number, whereas the subset, subset sum problem involves finding some sort of combination of things from your target, uh, from your set to meet, when you add them up, you meet the target, right? It's completely arbitrary, yet you can actually establish this. If you worked on this for months, you could come up with an algorithm that takes every input in A and points it to some transformed version of the problem in subset sum. Okay. And actually, as it turns out, because of the this thing where we, we can actually use previously established languages and NP complete, we don't actually have to do this. When the problems are far away from each other, like subset sum and factor, we don't need to come up with a reduction. We can just pick a number, uh, we can pick a language that's already NP complete into it. Yes. So in other words, I could point, well, no, I can't point this nine to two, five, 10, right? So the, so I'll put a big no, right? No, you can't point nine to two, five, 10. The reason is nine is in the language A, but two, five, 10 is not in the language of subset sum, it's not in B, right? So in other words, all strings that are in A, I can point them to any of the strings that are in B, but I can't point strings in A B can't point strings that are outside of A into strings that are in the B. Okay, so in other words, there's a big dividing line here, and your function shall not cross that dividing line. Okay, that's what the if and only if statement means. It means you're fine to go from within language to within language or outside of language to outside of language, but you will not, you know, you, thou shalt not cross that line. Does that sort of explain a little bit? Yeah. Um, it's more, so the, so, so basically they, NP complete languages have this property that everything inside NP is reducible to them. That's what, that's really what it is, right? So, you know, why is not factor an NP complete problem? because we can't put, there's no way to actually frame factor as a right-hand side to this problem because there's too many ways to, to find a solution to factor other than just brute force search, right? There's order finding, there's all sorts of things like that. Okay, so NP complete problems are the elite difficulty problems. Everything that's beneath them can be reduced to them, but you can't take something that's more complex and reduce it to something simple. That's, that's the idea here, is this has to be the more complex problem. You can't start with a complex problem and reduce it to something that's simple. Right? That's really what it is, okay? Oh, I haven't done a proof here. Right? This is by no means a proof, right? To, to, to prove using this method that I can reduce factor to subset sum, I'd have to write an algorithm that for every single integer here that's in factor, it points to some sort of mapping, it, it maps somehow to um, NP uh, to subset sum. And this is not a proof, right? This is just explaining the definition of reducibility, okay? 
So I'll show you what I mean. Let's take two. The reason why it's hard to see it here is because factor, like I said, factor and subset sum are a little bit far apart in terms, in fact, they're really far apart in terms of what you do in one problem to solve, to solve in what you do in the other problem, right? So we have to start with two languages that are close together, and that's what we'll do next. We'll look at vertex cover, right? We'll look at, we'll look at the language called vertex cover, and then we'll look at the language called um, set cover, and we'll show it's actually quite easy to reduce anything that's given to you in terms of vertex cover to, a, to an equivalent instance of the problem in set cover. Okay, because I can tell that's what your question is basically asking, right? If this is arbitrary, then why are we looking at it, right? There has to be some, I'll show you a method, but they have to be close together so you can see the linkages. So let's do that. Let's do, um, let's do vertex cover and set cover. We'll flip the board here. I might have time to come back to set. Okay, so if you want to follow along here, I'm gonna just do the vertex cover that I put in the notes. It's on, so let's start here with, um, so let's start with vertex cover and make this the example on page three. Okay, so I'll do the specific solution for this vertex cover problem. And then what we'll do is we'll reduce it to the general set cover problem. Okay, so vertex cover, vertex cover problem. Um, basically, for the vertex cover problem, you're given a graph, G, and you're given an integer K. Okay, so you're given a graph G and an integer K. And in this specific example that we're like, we'll look at, I'll, I'm just looking at the example on page three, we've got a graph that has five nodes and it goes A, B, C, D, and a little E tail. So this is our graph. It's A, Keep the labels outside of the region of the graph, A, C, D, and a little E tail off to the side. Okay, and a root. Okay, and we've got a box tail. Okay. And in this case, we've been given K is equal to two. So on page three, here's our graph and here's our um, here's our K value two. Um, to solve the problem, what we need to do is pick two nodes and see whether all the edges adjacent to those nodes cover the entire graph. In other words, if we, if we collect all the edges that are adjacent to the two nodes that we pick, do we in fact have all the edges in the graph? Right? So let's, for the purposes of finding uh, something that doesn't work, let's pick two, two um, vertices that, would, that it wouldn't work for. Okay? So let's pick, say, A and D. So try, so with K is equal to two, we try A and D as our vertex cover, right? So what we can do is we can mark on the graph, so it's a very visual process when we're solving it manually. We can mark on the graph which edges are included. So here's the included edges, one, two, are adjacent to D and this one, right? So D, E, D, C, and D, A are adjacent to D. Adjacent to A are A, D, and A, B. And you can see we're missing. We're missing the edge B, C. So try A, D, we're missing. Saying edge C. Okay, so this one is not, because it's missing an edge B, C, it's not a vertex cover, right? So obviously we can see what the solution here is. We wanna pick B and D. So we try again, k is equal to two, and we try n and d. b and d, if we pick those, so I'll circle b and I'll circle d again. Now I mark off b, c. So we've got our b, c edge that was missing before, and because we picked d, we have d, c, a, d, and a, e. So all edges are there, edges g, and that's what you're looking for, right? That's the definition of the vertex cover problem. Can you pick K nodes such that the edges adjacent to those, those K nodes, when you take the union of all those edges, do you get all the edges in the graph? And we do. Okay, so that's vertex cover. That's gonna be um, the language that we're, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, 
uh, reduced to. Um, in the notes, what we're trying to do is actually reduce vertex cover to set cover. So let's establish what set cover is. In set cover, we can actually do another example of that. We can do that from that example on page two, right? So now we'll, that's vertex cover. And here would be set cover. And you can see they're essentially very, very similar languages, right? So set cover um, involves getting a, set, a universal set U, a subset S, and an integer K, okay? And the set cover problem says, given a universal set U and a collection of subsets S from U, and an integer k, can you find k subsets that when you take their union form the universal set? Okay, and it's very easy. Once you do an example, you'll see this, right? So let's use the example on page two where we take crypto, what else, right? Crypto is our universal set, and then we have four subsets, and we're asked to find three of them that when you take the union actually creates the universal set. Okay, so for our example here, let's let u be equal to the crypto. All with commas in there, obviously, right? So each each letter is an element. So u is equal to crypto. We have that s1 is equal to s2 is equal to s3 is equal to and s4 is equal to. These are your subsets in s. So s contains the the subsets. S1 is to. To. S2 is cry. S3 is ROY, Y, S4 is equal to, we're going to need a P if it's going to work, yeah, COP, COP, okay, and we've been given the target K is equal to 3, right, in this case we have K is equal to 3, right, um, so what we need to do is find, so this, to solve set cover, we have these one, two, three, four subsets. We need to pick k is equal to three of them, such that their union is equal to crypto, right? And let's pick just for, again, for the purposes of picking a false solution, something doesn't work. Let's do that in, in red. So let's say we try S2, S3, and S4, right? So let's say we try, try S2, S3, S4. What's that equal to? Because we have K is equal to three, so I can pick three of them. So this will be S2 is equal to C, uh, C, R, and Y. C, R, Y. Union S3, we already have the R and the Y, but we can add the O. And S4, we already have the C, we already have the O, and we can add a P. Okay, and then we say, is this equal to U? Well, U must spell out crypto, I'm missing the key. It's not equal to U, so that one fails, right? And again, now let's pick out what the obvious solution is. So we're going to need this one and these two to do it, right? So let's see which one, which one do we pick in the notes here? One, two, and four, right? So one, two, and four, we'll do it because we get a three. Yeah, so let's try that, okay? So try S1, S3, S4, okay? Oh, no, we used S2, sorry. S2, so we try that. Um, what do we get? Well, here's S1, which is TO, TO, right? Add to that S2, which is CRY, so C, and add to that S4. We already have the C, we already have the O, but there's our P, right? And can we spell crypto, crypto? So this is equal to U, that's our solution, right? Our solution would be the three subsets, one, two, and four, S1, S2, S4, okay. Um, 
so so <laughs> Christopher Jones asking uh, is this definitely yes so obviously whatever we do today we set the stage for the quiz for sure um, Daryl has asked so if set cover has duplicate values do we just ignore them example like how s2 and s4 has to yeah yeah so it doesn't matter you're taking the union right and whenever you take the union of sets if you have multiple copies that doesn't matter right because the set is a set of unique elements it's a collection of unique elements so because we may have in s1 s2 and s4 because we have for example two c's we only write one of them down because C is a copy of itself. It's the same element. So we only represent it once. Yeah. Okay. So here's the thing. You can actually reduce vertex cover to set cover. Um, and although these two specific examples don't show connection, what we can do is take this particular problem in vertex cover and reduce it to an instance of set cover. So there's no connection, there's no direct connection between this particular problem right, and this one here. But what we can do is create, and this is what our function does, it creates a version of set cover so that when we solve set cover, we can find that there must be a solution to vertex cover. Okay, so Curran, you were asking about, well, is the connection arbitrary? No, it's not, right? Given a specific instance of vertex cover, I need an algorithm that creates a related um, problem and set cover. And we can do this because these problems, you can see it's the same thing that we're doing here, right? One is packaged as sets. The other one is packaged as a graph, okay? So to do that, I'm not going to write, because it's obviously in the notes here, um, we, can, uh, we can go over to the notes and just take a look quickly how you do this reduction. So let's do a share screen, show you how to do that. Okay, um, so here we go. Here's our reduction. So again, what you see in the notes here um, on page, this is page three. So this is the, the specific example of vertex cover that we solved on the whiteboard. We can't point it to the specific whiteboard example of set cover, but we can create an instance of the set cover problem that's solvable if and only if the vertex problem, the vertex cover problem is solvable. Okay, this is how you do it. All right, so here's your graph. It's the same graph we had on the whiteboard because we use this for the whiteboard, right? In that case, we were looking for a k is equal to two node vertex cover for the graph g, right? What we do is we let u be the set of all edges in the graph. Okay, so u is the set of edges. So there's this a, b is an element in u, b, c is an element of u, c, d is an element of u, a, d, and d, e are all elements of u. Okay, so our universal set is actually the edges in the graph. What are our subsets? Our subsets, s, a, b, c, d, and e, are simply the edges adjacent to the vertices a, B, C, D, and E, right? So now what we can do is we can solve this specific vertex cover problem as a set cover problem, right? So if I have an algorithm that solves set cover, I now run set cover to solve the vertex cover problem, right? And my set cover algorithm will say the answer to this problem that you've given me as a set cover problem is S A and sorry is um, S B and S D right? Remember on the whiteboard we found that it was vertex B and D. Formulated as a set cover problem, it's solved as the subset B and the subset D, right? And that is the specific problem reduction from vertex cover to set cover for this particular problem, right? Here's the thing. So, Curran, you're asking about how do you automate this for being, okay, great. You've done a connection for one problem again. Thanks a lot, Josh, right? How do you automate this? You write an algorithm that does what you just did here, and it does it for every instance of vertex cover, right? And the algorithm is just going to do what you said, but it does it in generally. It's going to let you be the edge set of the graph. And for every vertex in the graph, let the subset S sub V contain all edges that are adjacent to V in the graph then clearly every subset must be a subset of u, and we can solve this problem as a subset 
as a set cover problem instead of a vertex cover problem. Okay, and then we can claim we've achieved that if and only if, right? If and only if, if we can find a K node vertex cover for a specific graph, then we can always translate this over to a set cover problem, right? The other way says, if you have a translated set cover problem that originated from a vertex cover problem, if this set cover problem has a solution, that only has a solution if the vertex cover problem had a solution. So you have to go both ways, okay? Um, so questions about, so I'll just put the comments, let's put the chat bubble up here, right? So now questions about, questions about um, reductions. Right. So what I'll do, I'll go back to the whiteboard and maybe if you're not quite seeing, you know, how does the function play into it? The function is this, this, these one, two lines of instructions that we have. So what is the function, the reduction from vertex cover to set cover? It's these two instructions. Make a universal set consisting of the edges and make a bunch of subsets that are all, all the edges adjacent to the nodes. That's the actual reduction. And once you've done that reduction, you've now mapped that instance of a vertex cover problem to a set cover problem, okay? So let me just close the screen share and I'll go back to the whiteboard so I can write things. But uh, let's see, okay, so Masero is asking, can it be said that vertex cover can be solved within the complexity or using the method for set cover, but not the other way? Yeah, so you're thinking ahead. So here's the thing about vertex cover and set cover. I, you can reduce, so basically our function f of w, right? f of w basically boils down to um, take the, um, uh, the universal set, so let universal set be equal to, or be equal to the edges in the graph G, edges, edges in G, okay? So I won't use, I'll, I'll use a little bit of ambiguity here, but basically create a set of all the edges in G, right? That's step one. Step two, we're gonna be um, let the subsets, subsets be uh, all edges adjacent to, let, let the subsets be edges adjacent to nodes, right? Edges, edges adjacent, adjacent to vertices or nodes. So that, that creates your set S is equal to S one, it's two, etc. Right? However many nodes you have, you're going to have a certain number of subsets. Okay. This function fw allows you to take vertex cover and reduce it to set cover. But the Sarah's question is, can you, oh, sorry, you can't see that. So we can basically go this way. We can reduce, using this reduction, we can reduce anything in vertex cover set cover. And Sarah is saying, well, can then we also do the equivalent? Can I reduce every, every instance of set cover to vertex cover? And what might surprise you is the answer is no. This reduction is one way. It's only possible to take vertex cover to set cover. Set cover is not contained in the complexity of vertex cover, right? So that's a, is a very good question to ask. It's not obvious. Um, one of the things, if you want to convince yourself that it's probably not doable, is try some, this was our simple example of set cover. Try representing this on a graph and you'll find that it doesn't work. So these, there is more to meets the eye, than there's, there's more than meets the eye to a lot of these reductions, right? And you can't just assume because you can go one way th with a reduction that the same type of reduction, if you like make it backwards somehow, you can go backwards. It's not, right? And essentially what this means is that set cover is more computationally complex than vertex cover. Even though they look like the same problem, set cover has some other things that it has to be able to do. And I don't want to get into it right now, but basically vertex cover has, because it's been uh, it's taking place on a graph, 
um, the subsets have a specific have a special property. So it, it corresponds with a special case of set cover. But set cover as a general problem is more complex than vertex cover. So it, it makes sense when you think about it that you can go this way, but you can't go that way, right? Because again, we have the, the whole thing of this is that vertex cover. It reduces, and it does. We have vertex cover reduces to set cover. Right? What that means is the computational complexity of vertex cover must be contained within set, set cover. But for this particular pair of problem, you can't flip it around. You can't flip it, All right? So, yeah, so good question, Ms. Sarah, right? Or you can't flip it using this method, right? There, I mean, if you really want to get into it, there is a way to do it. Uh, I can't fit it on 10 whiteboards myself, but there is a long linkage that you can do, right? Similar to when Karen was asking, well, how do you reduce factor to subset sum? You can't do it in 10 whiteboards. You need to transform it over and over again until it starts looking like a subset sum problem, right? And it's, it's basically, it's graduate level math that you're doing when you do that. You need a whole bunch of things in between to do it. So there's no direct way to, to reverse this thing around. Okay. Good. So I'm just looking at the clock. Uh, I did want to cover SAT a little bit. Um, it looks like we won't have time to do that. So let's leave you with some, you know, if you're concerned, well, how much in my mind is going to be on the quiz? Let's make it really easy. Let me look at the... Uh, let me look at what we have in terms of exercises. Um, we at least did the mission critical stuff. So we did 8.1 and 8.2. Let's leave it at that. 8.1 and 8.2. We'll even leave SAT out of it. We'll talk about SAT on Thursday. Okay. So for the quiz, for quiz, be sure you can do 8.1 and 8.2. So in other words, be sure you're comfortable with solving vertex cover, specific case, solving set cover, specific case, right? And you're comfortable with taking an instance of vertex cover and reducing it to set cover, right? Not the other way, right? Vertex cover to set cover, okay? So we'll just ask quickly, are there any, uh, any, any questions, right? Good. Okay, the other thing to uh, to remember is don't don't put assignment three on the back burner, right? So just remember, I know right now you're going to start working on this to study for the quiz, right? But remember, A3 and A3MC. Um, assignment three and assignment three multiple choice are lurking in the background, right? Uh, less than two weeks now. So you have all this week, all of next week, up until Friday, which if you're counting days is less than two weeks. And as all of you know, in your second half of anything at Sheridan, two weeks goes by just like that, and the deadline's right there. So you may want to try some of the, you can solve, so based on what we've done today, uh, we've established all the theory you need to solve the entire assignment three, all the multiple choice computation stuff and the written stuff, right? even if you decide to do the induction, right? I even had enough on the board there showing the structure of the graph. You can probably uh, tease out what to do there with the induction question too, if you choose to do that, right? Again, I'm making induction optional now. Good, so any other questions? Okay, good, so we'll end our, uh, we'll end our meeting. And meeting. And uh, we'll see you on Thursday for the quiz, right? And again, like I said, for the quiz, no set cover, no vertex cover, right? Like not no, like no, K-N-O. Uh, uh, come into the quiz with knowledge of vertex cover and come into the quiz with knowledge of uh, set cover, okay? All right, see you then. Bye-bye.